Now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today. We have Karen Casino. Karen Casino is an alumni of Deloitte Haskins and Sells and has been participating in the area of litigation since 1989. Uh, Ms. Casino's practice specializes in family law, business valuations, economic damages, damage cases, and fraud investigations. She has been appointed by the Family Law Court as an evidence code section 730 um, special master on hundreds of occasions. Her family law practice involves engagements relating in business valuation, analysis of income available for support, um, apportionment of separate in the community property, complex calculations on high net worth cases, and tracing of separate and community property. And with that, I'm gonna turn the time over to Karen. Welcome. I, I appreciate everybody joining us today, and uh, I'm hoping that I can provide to you a lot of information that will be helpful to not only you, but also uh, your clients and maybe people in your life that uh, fit into this category that you can help. Okay, so let's go to the first slide. All right, so. Um, why are older adults at higher risk for exploitation than, than other people? Uh, they have, a lot of times they have a lot of assets and regular income. They have social security checks, they're retired, they've got, you know, money that comes in on a regular basis. Uh, they tend to be a little more trusting and polite. They may be si uh, socially isolated or alone. Uh, they may be more likely to pick up their phone, their landline even when somebody calls, because uh, they may just want to talk with somebody. Uh, they may be grieving a loss of a spouse or a family member or, or a pet. Uh, they, the sad part is a lot of times they're at the mercy of their caregivers, so they can't care for themselves on a daily basis, and so they're dependent upon others to uh, do things for them. And so that leaves them feeling vulnerable and uh, appreciative, but also, but, you know, very vulnerable and uh, under their control. They have health issues sometimes which affect their financial decision making. And this could be something that gets worse over time. Uh, and they may be unsophisticated with, uh, unsophisticated with the computers or online information or their phones. Uh, which a lot of this important information that uh, ties to their finances is tied to. Okay, next slide. So what kind of schemes uh, generally exist? Uh, the, the theft of money or property by a caregiver or an in-home helper, that's pretty common. They give access to their bank accounts and cash to their home, you know, to their home that has a lot of assets. And sometimes if they're, if they're bed bound and they're just in their, uh, their bedroom, let's say, or in one room, they're not in the rest of the house, the other people are taking care of them, then they, uh, you know, the assets could be missing or stolen. Uh, they're, they, it's, it's a very vulnerable position for them to be in. Uh, investment fraud and scams, which include deceptive free lunch seminars or selling unnecessary or fraudulent products. Scams by telemarketers, those are big. Identity theft, uh, reverse mortgage fraud and contractor and home improvement scams. Uh, so it, it, I'll go into a lot of the detail, especially the ones that are very common. But generally what's happening is people are making contact with the senior, whether it's over the phone, online, in person, they're, they're helping to care for them. They're getting access to uh, inf information, social security numbers, bank accounts, uh, their health account, their, their health insurance numbers, and they're convincing them to give them that information or agree to something like, oh my gosh, you need a new roof. You know, this is how much a new roof is going to be. And they really don't have a way to check and make sure that that's true. And they tend to be trusting. And so they fall under these scams a lot of times. So we'll go into and talk about a lot of the different ones. Okay, next slide. Sadly, uh, older persons a lot of times don't report the financial exploitation, uh, mainly because they're ashamed and embarrassed. Uh, they, they feel loyal to the people that are maybe caring for them, or maybe it's a family member 
maybe it's their trusted financial advisor. Uh, they have a fear of retaliation that, again, because sometimes they're in a pretty vulnerable position, depending upon the care of people that are taking care of them, they fear, you know, what's going to happen if I tell what happened? What, you know, what will happen to me and will somebody be there to care for me? Uh, dependence of, upon the abuser for, for care or assistance. A, a lot of times it's denial. Um, they, they, they just don't believe it. It happens. You know, my son or daughter would never do that to me. Uh, Self-blame. Self-blame, you know, well, it's my fault. I should have noticed that or gosh, you know, I shouldn't have asked these people to do all those things for me. So now that they, you know, took a bunch of money from me, it's my fault. Uh, fear of losing his or her independence. That's very, you've probably seen others in your life. They, they're afraid to lose their independence. They don't want their life to change. They don't want to uh, be dependent upon other people for their care or, uh, they they don't want to say that they're vulnerable to something falling for something that wasn't smart, you know. Any time that their that their ability to handle things is is uh, is questioned, it's just it's frightening to them a lot of times. So they a lot of times they want to appear as if you know I'm fine. I'm still able to live in my house. I'm still able to take care of myself. And so some of these things may happen to them and they don't want to let their, their family or their trusted caregivers know because they're embarrassed. Um, lack of awareness. So this could either be, they just don't know, you know, they've got all of these bank accounts. They've got, you know, all of these different investment accounts and, they just don't pay attention to it. So they're not aware of what's going on. Uh, it, it's too much for them. You know, they, they're, they're trying to do everything themselves and it's too much. Or it could be that the lack of awareness is due to a medical issue and that their, their, cognitive, uh, that their cognitive ability is, is getting a little impaired. Okay, next slide. Hey, Karen, uh, there is a quick, comment question. Um, it says, I volunteer on my country's elder financial exploitation task force and one of the biggest schemes um, that is often presented is the romance scam. Um, even with the elderly, I don't see that as one of the schemes on the list. The, the which scam? The romance scam. Oh yeah, it's on the list. Oh, we're going to talk, we're going to talk about that. Okay. Just wanna yeah, that it's quick. probably the worst one. <laughs> Okay, so right now we're in a pandemic. Um, a lot of us are staying home. Uh, maybe, uh, sadly, very sadly, a lot of elders don't have access to their family and their friends. Uh, they're very isolated. Right now there's a stimulus check that everybody, most people are supposed to be getting. And I apologize for that. Um, the, the, uh, the, I've even gotten some text messages and some emails uh, saying, hey, you know, what happened to your stimulus check? You know, call us and, and we, we can help you. Or, you know, have you noticed you haven't gotten your stimulus check? Uh, you know, give us your social security number and we'll help you uh, figure out where it's at. So right now there is, you know, a a, a big scam going on with not only elders, but just people that are getting that aren't getting their stimulus checks. I think most of us know that if you didn't file a, an electronic uh, tax return, then the money isn't going directly into your bank account. So uh, those mail-in refunds are are uh, the 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 checks we mailed to you. I've heard you know, may take up to 20 weeks. In fact, I, I haven't heard anybody that actually has gotten uh, a actual check. So um, I'm handing off my phone so that they don't bother us. Um, so there is a phone number to call. I put it on the screen. Um, make sure your elders and the people in your life know that uh, that 
the, the social security is not going to call you and ask for your social security number. <laughs> they have that. Um, we'll talk about this later on, but there are, uh, the, there's ways that they can manipulate the caller ID so that the, uh, it shows up as the social security administration that's calling you. So it does appear on their screen or their phone as if the, you know, the, the social security office is calling them. So let them know that that's not necessarily true that they don't need to do anything this check is going to be in their account or it's going to be uh, sent to them there is a website that you can go on and ask for the information to that the check to be electronically given to you uh, that's sometimes I, I've heard from clients that that's had problems so uh, it's been hard to get on and you know you don't want someone getting on the web wrong website and providing their social security number when they shouldn't okay next next slide one more quick question um it says i've heard of dead people getting actual stimulus checks that's all it says actually what was that <laughs> um i've heard of dead people actually getting actual stimulus checks oh good yeah i haven't heard anybody yet that's great news yeah good news yeah i don't that's great news that people are starting to get checks. Yeah. Okay, so the most common financial fraud schemes against elders in 2019. So, um, and I get these too. I get them. Um, the IRS impersonation scheme, they will call you and say that you, own ta you owe taxes and will threaten retaliation, including home foreclosure, uh, deportation. They ask for a wire, a certified check, or a debit card. Many times they'll keep coming back. So a lot of times they'll they'll say, hey, you have this problem, you know, send us a wire, send us a certified check or debit card. And then they come back and they say, oh gosh, you know, it actually was more. We went and we looked and, you know, you actually owe money at that. So uh, more money. So um, they can spoof the phone number that's coming in. So it looks like someone's calling from an A a collection agency or from one it'll say Washington DC or it'll, it'll say the IRS um, so so let it, it's it's pretty common and so let your your clients and your seniors know that one just because it's coming through like that doesn't mean that's who they they are Two, the IRS is not going to call you and threaten home foreclosure or uh, deportation or anything like that. There will be written notices that, that come in. And uh, next slide, there is a way for them to, uh, to call the IRS directly and confirm if, if there's anything like that that's really going on. I always tell my clients that are seniors, as I say, you know, there's nothing wrong with erring in the in the favor of hey you know what i didn't expect this call i can't verify who you are um so if you can give me a phone number to call back and i'll have my you know my son or daughter or i'll have my attorney or my accountant call you back usually those people will hang up right away so and and you know what if it's a legitimate call whoever is calling them will understand that you know they want to verify that that's true uh, robocalls and unsolicited phone calls. We all get that, right? <laughs> we all get that. So, and, and it's just, it can be a number of different, you know, the IRS, it can be them saying that it's, you know, a computer company and, and they need information. So really anybody that is calling that you don't expect to be calling and they're asking for bank account information, social security numbers or any personal information um, the the what we just tell clients is don't give it to them you know just don't there it should be almost no situation where some unknown person calls you and you are giving them your financial information or your social security number your bank account a credit card don't just don't do it um, the fcc and the ftc have been working on ways to to block the number because a lot of people see it as, you know, it's coming from this, this place. And so it's coming from Apple computers. So I need to, you know, that's a legitimate call. And, and that's a, a 
reasonable thing to be lulled into a sense of false security because when you get a call, we always uh, we always look at our phone and say, oh, okay, who's calling me? And you decide whether or not you're going to take the call. And if it looks like something that you, someplace you want to speak with, then you'll pick up the line. Uh, we do have a polling question. You don't want to just continue. Okay. So um, the, the FTC uh, don't, they'll say that from all kinds of places like that, maiden names, passwords, other identifying information. Do not, just don't give it to them and tell your seniors not to give it to them. Okay, next slide. Oh, haven't we all got? Haven't we got all gotten this one? That um, no, I don't know why my phone is doing that. Um, the haven't we all gotten this computer one? And sadly, what's really sad is I've had, I've had, um, I've had office managers at law firms of clients that I work with, and they've actually the law firms have sent money and, and given bank account information on these things. So this comes through as um, you're so lucky you inherited some money and we've been looking, you know, we've been trying to find you or, you know, your long lost relative or you've won a Jamaican lottery and um, you're entitled to all this money or merchandise and all they need is an account number and other information to get your millions of dollars to you or your inheritance. Um, so the, the, the US government has been working with Jamaican officials to cut down on the perpetrators of this fraud because they've actually reached out and there have been some operations to uh, get some of the people in Jamaica that have been doing this to, uh, to get actually put in jail and to stop doing it. So. There is some active uh, governmental forces at work here to, to make sure that we don't get as many of these. Uh, next slide. The tech support scams. Um, so, I, and I'm gonna go through this in detail later, but one of the biggest controls that you have for your senior is uh, if, if they have trusted advisors, they've got family members. They've got people that anytime something like this happens or they're, they're called or they're, you know, somebody, somebody comes through an email comes through or computer tech support person calls that they feel comfortable enough to call one of their kids or their grandkids or a trusted advisor and say, hey, this person's calling me. Does this seem right? Um, I've got a really good friend that uh, calls his mom every day and, you know, is very involved in her finances and, hey, don't do that. Or, you know, my Amazon package didn't get here on time. Okay, this is what you should do. And she fell for one of these uh, computer tech support scams. So um, this one has probably right now one of the highest success rates for the scammers. So they 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 call or they they email and they and it looks like they're from Microsoft or Apple or Dell and there's a they basically make up a story that the victim's computer had been infected with a virus and they convince the victim to provide remote access to their computer um, and their personal inform which your remote access to your computer the person can get into your personal information credit card and bank account information so some victims also find that these people, um, that they're online pop-up ads that they clicked on. So those are the two big ones is that they either get a phone call or a email that's saying it's from Microsoft or Apple or Dell and we, uh, we need to get, you know, get on your computer and call us or, or, you know, we're on the phone, we'll wait till you get on your computer and they basically get access to your computer and they can look up whatever they want and, find whatever information they want. Uh, ransomware, I've actually uh, had that happen here in my office where our computers were uh, shut down and it basically said, we have control of your computer and call this phone number 
um, or you know go down the block and and get some get some I forget what they were called back then some some debit cards and you know submit them or wire money this way um, so and they're basically asking for a fee to be paid for the victim to be able to use their computer again I uh, sat when it happened to me I just called my um, my website people and and they they were able to do something I do know firms that actually had to you know they they decided to pay to get their computer back it was or or they would you know crash everything that's on it in their whole system so these are um really damaging successful ones that not only hit seniors but hit us but uh, since we're just talking about hitting the seniors you know having someone that they can call that can help them walk through that or um next slide um, they Oh, sorry. Karen, there's a quick request for you. Um, banks can put a halt to wire transfers deemed suspicious. Can you speak to the lack of elder financial exploitation uh, specific training to appropriate staff that is allowing these scams to continue? Training must be tailored to the responsibilities of the position and many banks have ineffective missing training. I, well, I agree with that. Um, yes, uh, I actually have, um, I have a good friend that's a real estate agent and um, the, you know, there's, there's money wired all the time for real estate transactions and one of his buyers wired money to an incorrect account and that money's gone and there was no way to recover it. <laughs> it's just gone. Um, so certainly wire transfer fraud is, is is huge and any of you that do uh the wire did do legitimate wire transfers i i'm one of these old-fashioned people i actually go into the bank and i um, which you can't do right now but um, go into the bank and have them do everything directly from there but a lot of people do it from their cell phone their computer um and and just that yeah there needs to be really clear training and communication on wire transfers and it, it needs to be updated all the time because that's one of the biggest ones that's happening now and it's huge i mean this friend of mine that the buyer wired money to the wrong place it was a couple hundred thousand the the, the they didn't get the money back and uh, the deal fell apart they lost the money they couldn't buy the house yeah it's um it's really really important to make sure that you know every all of the information that you're getting is legitimate and it's real and it can be verified before wire transfers are sent out okay uh, next slide um so i this is what i was just saying don't give control of your computer to a third party ever uh, make sure that the new products you use don't take over the computer without you knowing um, there are some programs I think parents were using where they were, uh, it could track the activity of their kids or uh, some of the kids were putting this on their parents' computers to, uh, to help them track what, what they're doing. Um, so those, you just need to make sure that those are legitimate products and that they aren't, uh, you know, that they come from legitimate places. You understand what it is they're doing, because again, any anytime someone takes control of your computer, uh, then they can get into other places on your computer. Uh, don't rely upon caller ID to authenticate the caller. If you're concerned about your computer, call your security company directly and ask for help. And make sure that you keep your computer's antiviral software up to date. So those are just some good pointers. Uh, a lot of the people that I know uh, for their moms or their or their grandparents, the ones that pretty much do the updates on the computer and just check on things and make sure, you know, just it, it, you know, even I have trouble just keeping everything up to date on my computer. So it's, it's something that is, you know, an easy fraud for someone to commit against a, a, a senior. Uh, trust, trusted family members or caregivers stealing money. Oh, this one is just, it, it's so prevalent. I'm a forensic accountant and I get involved. This is primarily where I get involved is after the fact 
when someone has already taken and you're out control so it doesn't happen again. Uh, so most jurisdictions in your area have adult protective services, APS, that you can call for help. Uh, some areas have multidisciplinary teams that include social workers, medical personnel, seen, uh, people in the financial areas in the country have some pretty pretty extensive amounts of people that can help and that are set up to help. Uh, so some states have uh, laws that require financial professionals to bid financial exploitation of seniors to the authorities. Here in California, uh, the bankers if a long time and they come in and say, I need to withdraw $20,000 uh, before the, the laws here kicked in, the bankers just had to do it. They, they had no choice but to, uh, to do that because it's their money. Uh, but now here they can question, oh, well, what is it you're gonna use it for? Or, um, or if there are trusted uh, advisors or people on the accounts with the senior, they might say, do you mind if I call, you know, so-and-so and ask, um, you know, permission to do that? So, so there are some, some rules and some laws that are, that, that have been put into place. And uh, there are, if, if it's already happened and we need to figure out, you know, how much, how much it, how much was taken and maybe how it was done, uh, we can come in and figure out how much it was and then uh, put controls on it so that additional funds are not stolen. What's, what's generally happening there is somebody is uh, has control of the checkbook or um, maybe mom or grandma or grandpa or, or dad is, is, you know, very ill and they are just signing checks. They don't really know who they're writing checks out to. And so maybe their handwriting has deteriorated so the caregiver can actually even sign the name pretty easily. Um, you know, a lot of times the, the only person that might see that is the banker or the person that actually reconciles their bank accounts if that's being done by somebody other than the person that's giving them care. I saw a question come in. Uh, yeah, um, it says, uh, can banks require more than one trusted person consulted before any material financial decisions are made? Um, oh, good. You know what? I figured out how to find my questions. Um, can okay. banks re require more than one trusted person consulted before any material financial statements are made? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, as far as I know, at least the areas that I work in, you can have as many trusted professionals as you'd like on the account. Um, you know, the, the big recommendation would be to just insert yourself in that, that elder's finances, make sure you know who their banker is, make sure you know who their caregiver is, and, you know, if they're in a nursing home, oh my gosh, what's happening in the nursing homes right now with the with the coronavirus is so sad um, that that you know that you're one of the your person is one of the first people that you come to visit and you call all the time because they know you know they know that you're watching and that you are paying attention to what's going on with their medical care and with their finances and um, so yes yeah, see about getting added on to those accounts so that if there's something unusual going on they the bank might call you and ask if um, hey did you know grandma was taking out 20 grand out of her account no i didn't know that uh, let me talk to her and find out what's going on uh, next slide uh grandparent scams i had two good friends that this happened to <laughs> and um the you know the grandparent that it happened to was very you know, with it and smart and it, but they called and said, Hey, grandma. And she said, you know, Chase. Yeah, it's Chase. You know, I'm in Mexico. I'm in San Diego. So that's very believable that they're in Mexico. 
Um, and I'm, you know, I'm in jail and don't tell dad and mom because they'd be so ashamed to just, can you do me a favor and, you know, wire me some money or, you know, get some gift cards or, you know, just, I really need some help. And so um, grandma might say, gosh, you don't sound like yourself. And well, like, oh my God, my nose was broken. That's why I sound differently. And they, and they usually ask that the money be wired right away. So they don't have time to, you know, maybe even call their, their children or check on it. They just go, oh my gosh, I need to go and get that gift card or money, the wire, wire the money right away. And a lot of times these people come back again and again. And where the two people that I knew that it happened to, uh, they came back a second time. And that's when the grandparent, you know, finally said, oh, you know, this doesn't seem right. And talked to the parents, then they found out. So this is very common. And uh, letting them know that this is just, you know, common and Gosh, if their kid, if their grandkid really does call and needs money transferred or wired, they may not do it, right? Because we're going to tell our seniors, don't do that unless you know for sure that it's the right person. Or if you can verify it, um, sometimes they'll show it as, you know, coming from their grandkid's phone. If they know the grandkid's name, a lot of times they don't even know the grandkid's name. So um, just let, let them be aware of this one. It's very, very common and very, very successful. Um, I think I see a question. We advise clients making a large wire payment to someone for the first time to send a preliminary wire for much smaller and then send the rest after the recipient confirms rece receipt of the initial uh, wire. Great idea. Yes, I like that idea. And then there was another one, uh, to be clear, all prof financial professionals, at least here in Georgia, includes a bank employee. So that that's good. Uh, the romance scam. So that was a question earlier. This one just really pulls at your hearts, don't, doesn't it? Um, this is not just seniors, right? This is a lot of people <laughs> that that are falling for this. And so they'll contact victims either online through a chat room, a dating site, social media site, or email. And these scams, you know, sometimes they're they're making friends and and being, you know, getting to know them for weeks or months. And they may feel as if there is a romantic relationship with this person and they feel a connection to this person. Uh, and ultimately what happens is uh, they ask the victims for money for some reason. And so now that they feel that they have a relationship with this person, like, oh my gosh, you know, I've had medical issues and, you know, my daughter is having, you know, issues with their children. Uh, you know, and it may not even be a direct ask. They may kind of put that out there. And because the senior feels a relationship with this person, then they will, uh, they will actually provide money to them. And so um, probably the biggest control with this one, and this is a tough one because your senior or your child or whoever that is falling for this uh, may not, you know, and they may feel it's private. They feel, you know, kind of, I don't, embarrassed that they're reaching out and dating online. Um, but this is where somebody that, uh, that, this is where if you're talking to your senior, connecting with them, you know, weekly, monthly, you know, whatever, uh, as much as you can, that you can ask, hey, what's new? And, you know, they may mention, oh, I have this friend of mine in, in Maryland and we talk and like, oh, really? Well, let me, you know, without being judgmental or making them feel like, you know, they're not smart, maybe, hey, you know, I'd like to know more information about this person. And uh, certainly before grandma, grandpa, you send them money or anything like that, please let me know so that, you know, I can, I can check that out before you do that. Um, next slide. If one of the biggest things is making sure that you, again, are in contact with them, but if it, and while you're in contact with them, you're going to see if they're 
faculties are deteriorating because if they're starting to deteriorate, you probably want to uh, get to them, get to, you know, get as, as a signer on their bank account, get their bank accounts out of just their hands before anything like this happens. And then it's really somebody else's responsibility. Um, maybe they, they get an allowance for what as much as they need. And if anything unusual is run past another person, that's certainly a good control to have. Um, impending lawsuit scam. So they, this will show up as it's calling from law enforcement. Uh, there's a warrant for your arrest. You didn't show up for jury duty. You know, how believable is that? So uh, that will come through as you know, law enforcement or as you know, Sacramento. I live in California. Um, so some, some schemers have actually said to immigrants that there's an issue with their immigration paperwork and they need to pay a fee. So it's really gets down to these fake phone numbers that come through looking a certain way and then them telling a story like you have, uh, you have a warrant out for your arrest or that you, uh, there's some problem with your immigration paperwork and we need you to send us money. So it always comes down to getting us money or giving us information that we need to get into your bank accounts or your credit cards. So let them know that, you know, as legit as it sounds, uh, talk to someone first, verify it first. Nobody's really going to get too upset, even if they're legitimate, that you say, I'm not going to, sorry, I'm not going to give you any information like that over the phone. I, I need to verify this first. Usually they just hang up. Okay, next slide. Identity theft. So this is obviously probably our, our biggest, our biggest one that all of us deal with. So this can result in unauthorized credit card charges. They'll submit fraudulent billings to Medicare. They'll apply for and receive social security benefits. Uh, they can use personal stolen information to commit tax fraud, to even apply for jobs and earn wages. So medical identity theft occurs when someone steals personal financial information, their individual social security number, health insurance claim number. Um, so that's pretty common with the elders. Uh, the FTC tips include um, letting them know Medicare or Social Security are not going to be calling you for your bank account information or your Social Security number. So anyone that's doing that is 99% not legitimate. Uh, there will never be a charge for a Medicare or medical card. That's the other thing that they say. Sensitive personal or financial documents, keep them secure at all times. Review your medical bills just to make sure that you're not being billed for services you didn't receive because you may not know until you get some uh, receipts that show that certain things were paid for and they, they aren't related to you or to your senior. Next slide. So ways we can help. Um, it, to, to me, for as big of a problem as this is, uh, it's surprising to me how few uh, forensic accountants and CPAs actually uh, put this on their website as being something that they help with. Um, certainly the, the government and law enforcement seems to be in most areas really stepping up their, their awareness of this and their enforcement of it and, you know, having adult protective services and some multidisciplinary uh, teams in place in various cities and states where when something is going wrong, they can come in with people that understand the unique situation of the seniors and to, to help them. Um, the professionals that are involved um, might include a, a trust advisor. Uh, one of the things that is probably a good idea that I that I see recommended a lot of times is that uh, the older person should consider setting up a trust where they uh, they include all of their assets and they authorize uh, certain people to be in charge of their care and financial information. One, it's good to put everything all in one place the children or the people that are trying to help them. Nobody's ever really talked to grandma or grandpa or mom and dad and said, 
So where are all your bank accounts and what investment accounts do you have and what plans do you have in place? Because sometimes it's a tough conversation to have with somebody, you know, because you're thinking that somebody may pass away or may become incapacitated. Um, so you don't even know. I mean, there's a lot of cases I'm sure you know of where, where someone died and their, their family members don't even know where to start. So if, if, you're, if you've gone through the, the administrative task of setting up a trust, then all of their assets should be in that trust. Uh, you should know what the income sources is on a regular basis. And these issues like who's going to be in charge and what happens if, if the person gets incapacitated, what happens when they pass away, all these things can be uh, covered in the trust. And so a lot of these problems that we have uh, of having a lot of the, as long as this are set up in a trust uh, then we at least know where everything is. We can start maybe monitoring the, the bank account balances. We can get people in place that can help. Um, and as maybe their health deteriorates over time, there uh, can be uh, some controls in place for what might happen. So professionals that are involved with the trust or other aspects of the, their financial situation, their bankers uh, could notify the close contacts with anything unusual. We talked about that. Uh, so the professionals have a plan to check in with their clients yearly, uh, then they can find out that these uh, scams, these, these romance scams are maybe brewing. They, they might get a request from their, uh, their elder client that says, oh, you know what, I want to make sure I'm going to change my trust or my will to include, you know, John. And okay. You know, certainly they get they find sometimes that there might need to be some questions about who John is and what place John is playing in it in his or her life so that you can figure these things out early. Uh, trusted family members should be uh, known to the professionals and involved in the senior finances. Again, this is so the professionals can dis di discuss any changes uh, to their finances and their accounts right away. Uh, and, and I have, as I said earlier, check in with your parents, your loved ones frequently, ask about new people in their lives, changes in their lifestyle. As much as you can, if they're close by, check in on them, especially if they're uh, being cared for by a caregiver, you know, going to the house and just coming in unannounced and looking around and meeting the caregiver and noticing if, you know, gosh, what happened to all of grandma or grandpa's artwork? <laughs> it's all gone. Um, or just has the person look like they just completely moved in and grandma or grandpa's living in one little uh, bedroom of the house and the rest of the house seems to be taken by the caregiver's family. So, you know, there's, there's a wealth of information by just dropping in and seeing what's going on and calling and checking in and listening to your loved one and what's going on in their life. So um, also, it, it, you know, if they're in a, 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 a care home, then a nursing home, letting the staff know that you're watching and calling and, and checking in on them and question what's going on is always a really good thing. Okay, next slide. Uh, add, a trust, add trusted family members to accounts even before it's a problem. So when you get the inclination that maybe the health is starting, you know, the mind is starting to go just a little bit, uh, that's the time to get, the, you know, added onto the accounts. You don't, it, there's a lot of times with some of the like dementia or Alzheimer's, there, there's a point where they become more combative and, and they don't want to hear about it. You know, there is this golden moment of time where you can talk to them about it and it's not too overwhelming for them and, you know, get all of those things in place before it gets to be too far down the road. Uh, note any medical changes, especially relating to their ability to handle their finances. So get a handle on that before it's too late. Uh, there's some great software out there. One is called Silver Bells and the other one is called Eversafe. So you can get their information 
on those systems and it'll automate and track normal payments. So you remotely can be monitoring, uh, okay, did grandma's social security check get deposited? Did her, you know, did her income check from her investment come in? And um, cause the checks could be coming to their home and the caregiver could be getting the checks and transferring, you know, putting pay to the order of themselves and putting it in their bank account. So you can keep an eye on the banks, investment accounts, credit card accounts, real estate records, make sure that the that things aren't being changed, titles not being changed when they're not, uh, they may not be completely with it. So those things are happening. Don't hesitate to call your adult, uh, your local adult protective, your APS or police department. Uh, they should have training in what to do in those situations. We've been talking today about financial elder abuse, but uh, there's also just physical and sexual abuse that also goes on. And the APS in your area is trained in all of that. Um, it's, it, you know, there can be a very sad situation. So don't, don't be afraid to call them. If there's something that's going on right now and you know what's going on, Call 911, you know, get the police department on the phone. I know this is happening. Uh, they usually will get you to the right department and will get you to uh, the people that can help. The US Department of Justice has great information. If you just go online and look under elder justice, they've, uh, they've got some nice brochures and booklets uh, that can be helpful. There's a hotline that's run by the US Aging Committee uh, at 855-303-9479. 9470, you can go to their website at www.aging.senate.gov. And depending upon what area you're in, there's local agencies that could help. Uh, there might be some nonprofit agencies that can help. There might be people like me that, you know, we're working with some nonprofits that can help. Uh, normally, if you don't know who to call, uh, the first call can be to the APS or to the police department, and they might have referrals to uh, those agencies that can help. If you have a trust attorney involved, a lot of, t a lot of times they can be involved in that. So, you know, every, everyone is kind of rallied around trying to get, get somebody to help and uh, helping people because we don't, you know, we don't want to see this go on. And as forensic accountants, if that's, you know, your background and training, we certainly can help most of the time, sadly, it comes in after something's already happened. We get brought in to investigate uh, what happened and how much was taken. And uh, maybe a lot of times what happens too, sometimes what we do in this area is there's a trust that was set up and the person dies. And then after they're, they die, every you know all the kids come in and grandkids come in and start taking money all over the place. Um, so we come in after the fact, but we can help to set up controls for how it happened and how it cannot happen again. Uh, the other thing too is if you, I don't do anything other than litigation, but if you have clients and you do taxes and you, you know, have regular clients that are getting older or have parents that are getting older, talk to them about, uh, you know, the controls that they can put up in place and go out and you know, give talks to to people like trust attorneys and people like that, that one might be a good referral for you for casework and for some clients, but also can just get the word out. I think that the thing is just get the word out as much as you can. Some of these scams we've talked about today and some of the controls and, you know, if, if, if there aren't family members or um, people that are related to them that can help then have them get professional fiduciaries or you know other professionals that can help that can you know just make sure that this that the money is staying where it stays and that it goes to the people it's supposed to go to probably our biggest concern is making sure that the elder is being taken care of that they're not being abused that they're being you know looked after and that their money is going to be there when they need it because people are living longer now. So you want their funds to be a little available to them and their heirs, but mostly uh, to them. I think we had one more question. If they're, um, 
yes, there was a comment. There are professional fiduciaries. Yes, I'm glad that I mentioned that because yes, uh, there are that that's a good place to to find people that can take over this role. They can, if nobody is really able to uh, that qualified to to be in charge of the person's accounts or the family members are all fighting, you can get a f professional fiduciary involved and they would be in charge of bringing the money in and paying the money out and just making sure everything gets maintained. Um, so if others are on the account with the elder, will they be considered joint owners by the bank unless they are designated as a signatory um, only if joint owners, when the elder dies, this money will pass outside the estate directly to them. Maybe not what you want. Uh, yes, that Suzanne Johnson, great comment. Um, what, what I usually recommend is just that they are on the account um, or a trusted person. But yes, the language of that is important because, yeah, if you are on actually on the account with them and the person dies, then that person could go into the bank and take the money out. So yes, there is a difference between a trusted advisor and a person on the account. Um, can the banks require more than one trusted person consulted before any material friend, uh, financial decisions are made? Uh, you can request that. I know the banks here in California that I work with, um, I know that they will consult with at least one. I, I don't know if they will do more than one because, uh, you know, a lot of times it's just, you know, the senior comes in and uh, says, this is what I want to do. And they say, hold on, let me call your son, you know, and then they, let me call your daughter too. You know what I mean? So um, de definitely check in your area, check with their bank, talk to their banker and, you know, kind of figure out what the plan is. If you have a trust attorney and you've set up a trust, your trust attorney will have the answers in your particular state and can set a lot of that up within the trust also. All right, let me see, do we have one more question? Uh, one other suggestion to make is to go to the bank and require extra authorization for international wire or even bar them entirely. If there's no reason for the person to send one the ability to do this may vary by financial institution i agree with that um there's i know this sounds i don't think it sounds terrible but having a budget you know i i've I, a lot of my clients i've worked with just say just give your senior you know whatever it is they, everything's paid for by the fiduciary maybe and they get two thousand dollars a month or a thousand dollars a month and if they want to give money to some romance person or they want to pay for somebody's cruise, you know, that, who are we to say that that doesn't bring them joy? You know what I mean? Um, so certainly there can be a certain amount of money and if they want to do whatever they want to do with it and feel like they're not going to be, uh, you know, you're not invading their privacy, they have that money. They have a bank account where, Whatever the amount is, $500 a month gets put in every month and they can do whatever they want with it. They can buy extra makeup, they can take dancing lessons, whatever they wanna do, um, that's fine too. And then the rest of it's secure. And if they're wealthy people, then maybe that amount is a big amount of money every month. You know, So just, just consider those, those sort of things. Um, so if your bank doesn't have a process, doesn't have to process a transaction if they deem it suspicious, correct? The fact that it is their money shouldn't matter and EFE is a crime on the SAR form, just like terrorist financing or drug trafficking. If a bank suspected a transaction was related to terrorist and financing, they wouldn't process it. I agree, I agree. And, and most of the uh, bankers and financial planners and people that I've talked to, you know, are taking a really strict line about that. And, and people understand, they, they get that everybody's just being extra safe. Um, any other questions? Okay. Well, I think we're at the end of our hour and certainly you can reach out to me if you have any other additional questions and hopefully you've gotten some good ideas. It sounds like a lot of you have already uh, dealt with some of these issues and had some good suggestions. So make sure you look at the chat box too because it looks like everybody, uh, that there were some people that had some great advice. So thank you everyone, please be safe and um, health to everyone and 
uh, let's help those seniors where we can and get the word out.